appropriateness in the borough of Brooklyn, 10 J Street, Dumbo Historic District, it's docket number 165902, block one, lot 50, an altered American round arch style factory building designed by George M. Newell Hall Engineering Company and built in 1897-98. Application is to alter the north elevation, demolish rooftop bulkheads, construct rooftop additions, alter ground floor openings, install storefront infill, and modify loading docks and stairs. Hi, good morning, commissioners. We have a few models, so I will try not to delay the start too much. I'll introduce it just to get us oriented. Um, this is a project at 10 J Street. It's a large American round art style factory building located in the Dumbo Historic District. It takes up an entire block bounded by J, John, and Pearl Streets. The north facade faces the East River and will front the new Brooklyn Bridge Park. The application before you today is to install storefront infill. There currently is no infill at the ground floor alter rooftop bulkheads, construct new bulkheads, and to reconstruct the north elevation which faces the East River. Um, I will introduce Bill Higgins to speak about the history of the building. Um, thank you. Well, I, oh, oh, I that's the one that you're thinking of. Is that the right one? sort of conceptual background uh, for this proposal, um, if I may, before Iran Chen, the architect, uh, describes the proposal uh, fully. So as Gabriella said, um, we have a, an industrial building in uh, Dumbo, uh, this interesting location right here uh, on, on the river just uh, east of uh, the Manhattan uh, Bridge. Here is uh, another view of the building. And here's a view of the building from uh, the middle of the river. Um, so what we have is an interesting uh, historical uh, situation in terms of evolution of this building. Uh, it was built in 1897 um, as a uh, sugar refining uh, building. And it now has, as you will see, uh, a combination of three uh, original elevations uh, which have been stuccoed over the original brick. Um, an original rooftop uh, penthouse here uh, and a wall which is not original and as you will see was not even an exterior wall which has had quite a long history of change. So here is the, the building uh, just after its, its construction. It was the Arbuckle Brothers Sugar Refinery. There was a combination of, uh, as we all know, Domino. Uh, there was a combination of sugar and also coffee uh, that was very uh, active in, in this part of, of Dumbo. And so this was Arbuckle started out as coffee. They got into a sugar battle with the Havon Myers, and uh, they got, went into the sugar um, business. So this is what the building uh, was originally. 
but it lost in the 1940s. It had removed these nine bays, this whole area uh, facing the river uh, to the north. So these are 1930s and uh, transit photo on the left and 1940 tax photo on the right uh, showing uh, the building, uh, the original portions of the building that survived. It uh, was and is uh, a brick building. Uh, it had slight, has slightly arched uh, window openings uh, and there was a variety of, of window infill types uh, but the most common were these uh, multi-pane, I believe, 12 over 12 windows. Although there was this interesting and so far to us somewhat baffling situation where there were these, <coughs> there were these projecting sort of faceted angular um, projections, we think what happened, and you can see it here, is that these windows were, uh, were top hinged. They were sort of awning windows. They would allow uh, the, the, the uh, opening to open up and allow things to come in and out in this open area of the hopper below. But they gave to the facade, a, a facades, a quality of, uh, of interesting random projections uh, coming off at, at angles, um, which we think is, very, uh, is a very interesting part of, of the story here. Um, the, there were a combination of entrances and loading docks at, at the base of the building. Uh, some of those had uh, wood and glass doors, others just opened up into, uh, into open, uh, open loading docks and a series of bridges uh, now no longer extant, connecting uh, the building to other parts of the complex um, across the street. So, Here's the original factory structure. Uh, this, is, this is the river. Um, here is the demolition of those, uh, that half of the building, those uh, nine bays on the, on the north facade. And then subsequently, um, the current facade uh, was added. Um, we feel that this huge act of you know, call it cutting or slicing or chopping or removing or whatever it is, is a great big part of the history of this building. And we feel that what has been done with this north facade um, was done in a very utilitarian fashion, uh, clearly uh, not original as you'll see in a second. And the whole premise of this proposal is that, particularly with the building dramatically facing the river, um, it is possible, we think, to make architecture um, that is inspired by this uh, huge occurrence in the building's history of losing a great big piece of it. Um, what can be done with that uh, that is not just filling it in with, uh, with, with windows? Um, so here's what's happened uh, to the north facade because we are going to be, we are asking you uh, for uh, uh, a determination that it would be appropriate to remove this north facade. So here is what it's like now with uh, some generations of stucco uh, over, over brick. Um, we've counted up to 12 window types, um, none of them uh, original. Uh, various openings and closings of elevator and window openings uh, uh, over time. Um, and this is maybe a little hard to see, but here is the first historic photo we could find from the 1940s after this partial demolition was done. So here is the north facade facing the river as early as we could find it documented. And here are the comparable bays now. Um, and even from that time to this, there has been substantial change. You can see that at that point, uh, almost all of those uh, openings uh, were filled in. There were projections um, made where the, um, uh, the structural columns were uh, out forward of the, uh, of the major uh, plane. Uh, and now um, there is a, a whole different set of, of infill and, uh, and windows, etc. cetera. Um, Russ Newbold is here if you have any, any questions. Um, about this, but basically what we did were, were probes here. 
uh, on this north elevation where what we found was really pretty interesting. These are the project, these are the columns, these are the major structural columns which we believe were freestanding, uh, just interior columns um, uh, previously. And what happened was, uh, here's a, a drawing of that, what happened was that in order to support brick uh, facing of those columns, later shelf angles were, were bolted on. And so what you have is a combination of brick masonry that rests on the beams between the columns and then slightly forward brick masonry that rests on these, uh, on these shelf angles. And as far as we can tell, the character of that masonry is the same. Um, so we are placing this at, at, at the same period of construction from which we would conclude um, that, that basically we had, we had an open column situation inside and they made an exterior wall um, out, of, out of it. Um, we uh, would contend that uh, um, this is not a historic feature, it's not one that has uh, uh, architectural um, significance and that it presents an opportunity uh, for creating a, a, a much more interesting architecturally and historically enlightening uh, facade treatment. So just before uh, I turn uh, this over to Iran, um, just a, a, a summary um, of what this project would be. So architecturally, what we are proposing to do is on the three, uh, three facades other than, than the north, we are proposing to remove the stucco and expose the original brick. The stucco, happily, on these three facades is on wire mesh, um, rather than being directly, wire lath, rather than being directly on the brick. So based on, uh, on probes, we think it will come off um, fairly easily. We are proposing new windows, arch top, multi-pane, um, and new infill uh, down at the base that does not restore but is very much in the spirit of, of, of what those uh, miscellaneous loading dock uh, base openings were. So on the three facades there would be a reading that is very close to a restored historic building. Then on the fourth facade um, uh, facing the river we are proposing as Iran will show you a new facade which explicates that idea of the cutting of the building. And it brings in a whole bunch of themes. The structural steel um, uh, that was inside the building uh, before, those uh, angled, faceted projections from the, from, uh, the building. Um, we think a little bit also about the, uh, the, the, the flow of the water uh, and the secondary theme of, of the structure of the bridges that is sort of behind all of the views in, uh, in in, in Dumbo, um, and we think that uh, all of that can uh, bring us to a really interesting architectural treatment. Uh, and then finally, um, we are proposing um, to uh, replace, reclad um, in the same footprint um, and very close to the same height, the existing uh, rooftop structure that is already there. So those are the major parts of this proposal and some of the thinking behind it. They're on. Good morning, Iran uh, from ODA. Pleased to be here this morning. As Bill mentioned, uh, this is a very exciting uh, proposition for us because for me it includes two elements that are independently uh, super important uh, to the issue of preservation. One is the restoration and preservation of an existing building to its original state. And the other <coughs> one is using architecture where, where there's no wall to restore, no facade to preserve using architecture to tell a story. And to tell a story that started in 19, uh, 1897 and ends today in the <clears throat> evolution of the neighborhood and evolution of this building. I hope I used this, okay. The first inspiration stems from the idea of breakage. And it goes back to 1940s where the building was broken. And the essence of breaking uh, a, a volume, like breaking a rock, etc., kind of brings two elements to mind. One that the brick 
for a portion is not two-dimensional, it's three-dimensional in essence, it has depth to it, and the other one that the inner part is different from the exterior part. Elements that are three-dimensional actually occurs in the building by the nature of the structure itself, which is very three-dimensional, and what Bill was mentioning before, the projections in the historical building. So that idea of building a three-dimensional facade was one of the essence of our, of our proposition. The secondary uh, concept from the left here was the idea that this was a refinery sugar building. And that's sort of, I think it's very important to the history of Dumbo in general and this building in particular. And even though it's poetic in essence, the uh, crystallized nature of the sugar is something that inspired us to design this facade as part of the storytelling of the architecture. Other buildings in the neighborhoods that are modern and, and, and newer additions to the neighborhood and usage of steel and glass is something that we wanted to uh, propose as well. And very interestingly, uh, Manhattan Bridge that is a major architectural element that is so close to our building and would always, almost always, would be seen together. And the nature of the facet or the sort of triangular structure that uh, holds the integrity of his structure. Lastly, this is the front most building on Dumbo, on the north side to the water. It's the closest one to the water. And the idea of the dynamic nature and reflection of the water is something we wanted to catch. This is what we're proposing as a facade. Now, this is kind of complex, and we're going to show many methods so you understand what exactly we're proposing. The first thing would be the big model. And if some of you can't see, I, I really recommend that you kind of stand up and, and look at this. But this is basically the original building. This is the portion that was demolished. When it was demoed, what was revealed was the exposed slabs that were remained. And what's missing here is the columns, which we're keeping, uh, the, the, uh, the steel columns uh, in front. What we're proposing to do is add this facet three-dimensional facade. It will become a very dynamic and sculptural piece that represents many things that we talk about. Uh, during the day, uh, it's going to be very monolithic or more monolithic and reflective. And as the night comes and light comes from within, I don't know if you can have the dimmer, no electricity. Oh, that's great. oh all right, the show is gone. <laughs> the fireworks. Yeah. We'll work on it. Let's see, maybe in the kitchen. Okay, you'll see that as we light the lights inside, what comes out is the um, very articulated and complex nature of the steel elements at the front. So essentially, it's a pretty organized and structural steel element that aligns with the base of the building, the existing building right here, that as it goes and proceeds up, becomes more distorted, broken, and a little bit random. Within that steel structure, there are glass elements in fields that are three-dimensional as such. And in that bigger model, you see uh, clearly how this thing is, is going in and out. The way its structure is, is really three essential three bays that repeat themselves in a random order. And each one is slightly different. It's very important to us to maintain the general order of the building, the existing building, which really divides into the, the base, the shaft, and the attic through these original uh, brick shelves. And the structure of the new facade is also divided as such as the base, you know, the attic, and the shaft right here. So this is just a glance of the original Old North facade, which is gone, the existing building right now, and what we're proposing. And at this point, uh, a technical drawing that shows the extent of the complexity of the facade. Basically, all of these are external steel elements. They are faceted uh, with uh, the steel mullions uh, dividing the, uh, the glass and that the floor Basically, you see in these plans, it's kind of zigzag in and out in a fashion that repeats itself, but yet organic in nature. At this point, I'd like to run a fly through a movie that we've done for it to see the building uh, in perspective from the water and from the neighborhood.
you want. So in essence, I think the architecture here really takes the role of the visual biographer, if you will, and it's a rare opportunity because it, it doesn't happen a lot in the city. The buildings are being split and half of them are, are remaining. One thing to point out that is very interesting, the three remaining facades are the ones that are actually facing the district. There's no point in the district unless you cross that bridge or come into that constructed park that you'll see that north facade. So there's a sense of transition between what is preserved as part of the history of the neighborhood and the face that it has towards the city and the new constructed park. By the way, this is under construction right now. A word about the penthouse. The penthouse uh, existed uh, from its original form and we're uh, maintaining uh, its shape and size. It has two facades, the east one and the south one, that are flush with the historical building and some of the uh, existing facade is actually there covered with stucco uh, and we intend to preserve it. And then the two other facades were distorted and, and demoed many times. The columns that you see here uh, are from about 10, 15 years ago. There was a proposition to add three more floors to the building. Uh, there was actually a permit that was executed for it and uh, we're obviously not going that route. And so the two uh, north and west facades are going to match in character the new facade, which is basically a storefront window with steel elements, keeping it uh, super simple. In terms of the roof plan, this is the existing penthouse plan, and this is the proposed. Uh, it's obviously two apartments. The new cores are shown in here, and these are going to be terraces. And in terms of a section, you'll see that this is the existing section, and we're maintaining the exact same section, not touching any of the height or the volume. The only thing that projects out beyond are the two new bulkheads, as you can see in this model, that accommodates the new, uh, two new elevators, the stair, and some mechanical spaces. Section through the other side shows exactly the same thing. Here's the existing roof. Here's the proposed roof with the bulkhead. As for the facade, as I mentioned before, the two facades that are part of the uh, facade of the building, the south one and the west one, and the east one, this and this, will be restored to its original state. And the two other facades will be a glass window wall with steel verticals and horizontal divisions. As for the visibility of the penthouse uh, bulkheads, I want to go through this very briefly. In essence, the bulkheads are very minimally visible. Uh, from any point that is approximate to the building, you don't see them. You have to go about two blocks away on the east and west. No visibility from the district itself. And of course, from the bridge in Manhattan, you'll see, uh, you'll see them. And I'm going to run through this really quickly. This is the existing building looking from John Street on the east side. This is the proposed. So this is an existing bulkhead right now that's going to be removed and replaced with a new one that is slightly wider and shallower. You see it here in the zoom view. This is the portion that you see. Uh, same thing from the other side of John Street. This is existing with this bulkhead, which will be removed. That's part of a later elevator addition. We're going to clean this up and then add this little bulkhead that you see here. That's that. And from the bridge, of course, as you higher up, this is the existing proposed, and you see those two gray, light gray elements. We want to keep them light and gray to blend into the sky and the background building behind us. And this is a view from Manhattan, existing and proposed. As for the restoration part of the building, I'd like to call Ross to just say a few words about uh, our scope of work. All right. So um, we know this is part of the project, but um, it's pretty much a staff level approval. Um, what we propose is the removal of the existing stucco, and as Bill said, um, there's a wire lath that it was applied to, so we're, uh, based on the probes that we've done, we're very hopeful that um, we can restore the facade um, in a meaningful way. Um, where we've done the probes, we found that the stucco uh, mesh was actually uh, nailed to the mortar joints, which is even better, but um, that may not be the case in every location, um, but yet um, we're very hopeful. It was also painted at one time, which will help with the bond break. Um, with restoring the stucco. So um, 
we're hopeful about that. We've developed a series of restoration details that we'll go through with the landmark staff about and work closely with them with the mock-ups and uh, restoration and removal mock-ups of the stucco. Um, and also, as Bill had said, um, we're proposing a replacement window for the three facades that are going to be restored. Um, we're proposing a uh, multi-light uh, with an applied muntin and aluminum a double hung window um, with a great performance uh, characteristic um, that will uh, replicate um, to the best extent possible the original windows. And, uh, that's it. Yeah, I wanted to thank AJ, um, I want to thank Russ Newbold from AJLP, who's going to be in charge of the facade restoration. My name is Mark Barak, I'm a project architect with ODA. And I wanted to discuss um, the other three facades of the building. And I want to pick up on the comment that um, both Iran and Bill made, which is that we have three faces which are going to be seen very frequently from Brooklyn, especially Dumbo. We want to make sure that we match the character of the building. So looking at the ground floor, there is an existing depressed slab on the west side of the building. It's four feet below the typical main floor, and that was to create a loading dock. We plan on keeping that. But we also plan on depressing the southeast corner of the slab so that we can have street level retail. You can see that there's a historic photo where there was an article about when the loading dock was originally created. Within the actual bays along John Street and J Street, we don't have as much information as we want about the way they were originally enclosed, but we have two proposals. For the retail, we would have a storefront system that matched the scale of the existing photographs, as well as tying it in with the rest of the facade. For the other portions of the infill, we're recommending that we go with a solid panel. This is picking up on some of the historic photos from when it was more of a warehouse, when not every window opening was filled with glass. Looking at the facades, you can see the history of the building, its current state, and what we're proposing. When we look more closely, specifically at the ground level, we want to reiterate that we've taken a lot of time to look at the historical character of Dumbo, not just from the way it originally was created, but the way that it's been interpreted now. <clears throat> One major change that we're doing along John Street is that we're going to be removing the existing entry canopy. We're also going to be pushing the ramp and the stairs back one bay. This will allow more retail on the corner for a more engaged space. Then, along the south side of the property at John Street, you'll see that we decided not to go with a monolithic storefront all the way across. After reviewing a lot of different projects in Dumbo, we realized it's very rare when you see a completely uniform street front. So what we're proposing is to maintain a certain sort of rhythm, and we'll also be switching between glass and a solid panel. Along the west side of the building, there's already been demolition for the loading dock, so we're proposing turning that all into street level retail. We don't have much history to go with for the building, but we were able to look at some local cues to see that signage should be subtle, and for the light sconces, we were able to find this one historic image to see that they were originally subtle and they just accentuated the bays. Finally, we're proposing a canopy for the residential portion of the building. There's a few precedents that we found within Dumbo, specifically the one on the left, and the idea is to keep it simple, steel with a glass top. And finally, we wanted to show the animation one more time. <laughs> well, well, let's go. I, think, up I, know, I, think we can, yes. I just wanted to clarify that uh, what we are proposed on the There you go. Sorry. I think it's fine. I'm Unless everybody wants to see that. I, I think it's okay. If it was uh, very effective the first time. Thank you. Um, just one sentence to clarify. That what we are proposing for signage, um, we don't know the retail configuration. So we are proposing a maximum of uh, signage on every other bay. It would never be more than that. It could be less. And I just wanted to clarify that the three-story addition that the project architect that was filed and permitted before Dumbo was designated. This Dumbo's been designated since December 2007, and um, those, the, that permit was pulled 10 to 15 years ago. So it was not commissioned. So it's never approved here? No, it never, we never saw it, because we weren't regulating Dumbo at that time. Okay, uh, are there questions for the applicant? 
Yes, I Addy? Have, um, two questions. Um, firstly, I'm not sure, it, there's a little piece of the image here, but I'm wondering if you can clarify what the condition is at the corner where the brick meets the, me, meets the glass and, and elaborate on that. That's number one. And two, had you given any thought to um, having the, this is north face, right? The north face of the penthouse be sort of the original like brick um, with openings uh, rather than a, a, an extension of this kind of setback of glass. Okay. Uh, to, the, uh, to the first question, what we're proposed to do is return the brick in a 16 inch return before it transforms into the glass portion. So uh, it's a good question. We kind of debated of how we're going to deal with it. We can't just leave the edge of the thin brick there. We're going to return in 16 inches on both sides and then start the uh, new facade. As for the penthouse, yeah, we tried many uh, different variations. Since there's nothing significant that is left to, to deal with, uh, it just seems like when we proposed this, if you look at that rendering, the brick wrapping around was sort of heavily sitting on the, what seems to be like a light kind of framework. Um, we just decided to go that route, but we're not, you know, you know we're open to suggestion on that one. All right, other questions? Yes, Roberta. Um, you alluded to the fact that the, um, the, the attic, the top part, um, is different and somehow relates to the attic. Mm -hmm. line on the other side. Can you just show that? Yeah. Over? It's hard to see from that image. It's easier maybe in the model. But there's three portion of the existing facade that creates the order of the building. I don't want to break this model here. Oh, wait, you can why see you it The base, the shaft, and the attic. They're basically divided by horizontal brick shelf that is projected about 12 inches out. Uh, but the base is is farther articulated by those projected frames. And then the rest is pretty much a continuous uh, brick and punch of windows. So what we wanted to do is, is divide that order into a base right here, which is the V-shaped uh, structure, if you will, that holds up to the fourth floor and continues that line, uh, the horizontal line of the base. Then create the portion, this is the shaft portion, where it kind of alludes to a random break of the steel, and then goes back into somewhat an ordered facade at the attic, at the top line, aligning again with the brick shelf in here, ending with a simple ending. And, and, and that's sort of our translation into that uh, division. What is that line? What is it that I'm seeing here, the, the horizontal? This? Uh -huh. Steel. It's steel coming, it's projected. Yeah, yeah, it's a projected oh. steel. Yeah, it's a projected steel detail. <coughs> Same as this one. Other, uh, yes. And I, and I guess I agreed in terms of the, that bulkhead, um, it would be more interesting, I think, to see it in original. For me, if it were looked at as continuing the original material, then if we were accepting this to only have the wall as because it wasn't part of the piece that was actually broken. Uh, no, I, 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 I we, we didn't talk about that. Just to be clear, there, the other three elevations, there's existing historic material that they're restoring, but at, at this elevation that faces north, there's nothing there, so they would be recreating red brick and punch openings where we don't know necessarily there, it was like that. OK, other questions? All right, why don't we take uh, testimony? Barbara Zay. Barbara Zay of the Historic Districts Council. While HDC applauds the sensitive treatment of the three elevations to be faced in brick, as well as the storefront infill and modifications to the loading docks, we find much to be desired in the proposed north elevation. 10 J Street is a muscular building characteristic of the industrial architecture that defines Dumbo. It is this muscular style that draws people to live and work in the area. Given that its Manhattan-facing buildings announce the neighborhood's prevailing style and presence, the lacy, airy quality of the proposed crystallized glass facade is inappropriate and incompatible with the district's strong masonry walls. Unfortunately, rather than relating to and respecting its fellow historic factory buildings, the proposed design seems to take its inspiration from a planned construction project just to the west 
a glassy building outside the historic district boundaries. With the construction of so many glass buildings in and around Dumbo, it would be a shame to lose one of the protected buildings of the district to the same treatment. Further, as the renderings show, a walkway and green space is planned to the north of the building along the river, which will make the facade visible not only from Manhattan and the bridges, but also from within the neighborhood itself. A masonry facade would be a much more appropriate and sensitive approach as the northern gateway to the Dumbo Historic District. Thank you. Thank you. Doreen Gallo. Good morning, Chair Sreenan Bossen, Commissioners and LPC staff. My name is Doreen Gallo and I am here to testify on behalf of the Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance Preservation Committee on the proposal for 10J Street in the Dumbo Historic District. The Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance is responsible for the Dumbo Industrial District being placed on the state and national registers in the year 2000 and the advocate for the Dumbo Historic District becoming New York City's 90th Historic District at the end of 2007. DNA is very excited to see that the applicant is taking great care to remove the stucco facade and restore the brick masonry on three sides of this building and would like the north facade to receive the same contextual and restoration treatment. The simple brick facade articulated primarily by its segmental opening marks 10 J Street as an example of American Roman arch style. Together with its steel frame construction, Construction makes it representative of American factory architecture of this period, contributing to the architectural and historic character of the Dumbo Historic District. The Dumbo Neighborhood Alliance asked that LPC reject the proposed demolition of the building's north facade and reject the proposed crystallized glass facade replacement. The applicant is trying to match the facade to a proposed new construction adjacent building at 111 John Street site inside Brooklyn Bridge Park and not in Dumbo's historic district. By not including the Manhattan Bridge in Dumbo's district, this allowed the Brooklyn Bridge Park Development Corporation to lay claim on this open space that DNA advocated successfully for in 1997 to be considered included in the park and assured that the parcel would be added as dedicated parkland. Instead, the John Street building will be destroying one of the greatest scenic views in Dumbo, the Manhattan and Brooklyn Bridges. The applicant's position that the north facade faces the water and not the historic district is no excuse not to retain existing brick fabric and restore the excuse me, facade to something that resembles the original building. This, it, there is a planned pathway connecting J Street to the river along the front of the building. The north facade is extremely visible viewed from the river in front of the building and from Manhattan. Proposed crystallite glass facade is not remotely contextual or in keeping with the industrial district. With regard to the proposed rooftop addition, we ask that the commission take special care with what is approved. Um, I know the applicant is saying that it's exactly the same in size, I'm not so sure. Um, and we hope that the bulkhead could be retained within that envelope. The integrity and character of our district has already been severely compromised with rooftop add-ons and bulkheads that don't necessarily improve any of the buildings. DNA is concerned and asks that the commission take special care with regard to the Belgian Block Street on the south side of 10J. I'm sorry, your time is up. Okay. okay, thank you. The next speaker is Christabel Goff. Christabel Goff for the Society for the Architecture of the City. In 1929, René Magritte painted a very lifelike image of a pipe and titled it, Ceci n'est pas une pipe, this is not a pipe. Asked, why isn't it? He said, try putting tobacco in it. The image of the new facade proposed here could be entitled this is not an historic district. It doesn't do what historic districts do, and it can't be used as they are. Historic districts preserve both local architecture and some ambience of the past. They let people who want to do that live surrounded by what is variously called history, heritage, patrimony, special character. New architecture can perfectly well fit in ingeniously, or it can disrupt, channeling some alien new development from Williamsburg, Chelsea along the Hudson, Miami, the south of Spain. 
In this part of New York Harbor, we don't face the ocean, and water views are a two-way street. Buildings from which you see are also seen, in this case, widely, from the river and from Manhattan. And the water facade is the face of the Dumbo Historic District. A strip of land once designated can remain an historic district in the eyes of the law, but what is built on it can also shout, this is not an historic district, not anymore. And thank you. Are there any more speakers on this item? All right, Community Board 2 submitted their resolution. Uh, they have uh, five specific motions, which I'll just read very quickly. They recommend disapproval of the demolition of the north facade and construction of glass curtain wall. They recommend approval of the profile without comment to material which has been determined, of the replacement windows on the west, south, and east facades. They recommend approval of the massing of the penthouse and new elevator stairwell bulkheads with opposition to glass on the north and west facades. Uh, they recommend approval of the modifications proposed to the ground floor, and they recommend restoration of the three big brick facades with replacement infill only where necessary. All right, yes. Uh, Bill Higgins, yes, this is a discussion that has gone on for centuries, and I guarantee <laughs> you that I will not prolong it. Um, however, th there is a really fundamental philosophical difference here. Um, between the position that says you make new interventions very specifically in the language of the old architecture, and you do not introduce substantially different materials or languages. Um, this is quite simply a position that this proposal and those of us who formulated it strongly disagree with. Um, it is particularly with the history of this building, with a major thing that has happened to it. Of course, it occurred to us that we could take a really safe uh, approach and assume that there's no difference between restoring what really exists and creating something new that simply looks like a part of what had existed all along, even when it didn't. You can do that, and it looks, you know, it would all be brick, and it would all have punched openings, and it would all be very uh, obvious, and it would say very little about um, dynamism uh, or the water or the history of what happened to this building. We chose a different route um, and I think it speaks for itself. I will simply end by saying though that the route we chose was not the route of imitating some glass building that is going to be built somewhere near here and it is not the route of creating, to coin a phrase, a glass box. Um, People talked about muscularity. If you look at the, that large scale detailed model, there is a lot of muscularity in this facade. There are very powerful echoes of the steel construction, which was also mentioned uh, in the testimony, the industrial character, the context of the bridges. We think that we have found a way to respect the history of this building and in fact to to help to explicate and, 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 and help everyone to think about the history of this building without simply parroting other parts of the building that survived. I just have a question. Uh, because this was raised by um, the testimony, uh, this is a very unique site. And I must say the design is, uh, is exceptional. Um, but in terms of appropriateness, uh, it, I guess it's a philosophical question which is more about the waterfront and how someone reads that and why you believe or whether you believe that this building from the view from the waterfront and from Manhattan should or does recall and speak to the historic district. Okay. Um, I'll try to summarize our, our appropriateness um, arguments. Um, Iran talked about the organization of the surviving historic facades uh, into that tripartite 
uh, organization based on the projecting br brick string courses and the way we are reflecting not in brick um, but in glass and steel um, those basic organizations of the building and that base shaft capital organization happens over and over again on practically every building that we that we all deal with so there's a, a basic geometry that is there um, the materials um, certainly glass is not the material well at least glass like this is not the material that was in the windows historically. However, all throughout the facade, um, the expression of these large metal members uh, is very much based on and re recollective of um, the steel that was inside the building and we show in a historic photograph showing that. But finally, um, that uniqueness of, of, of this site and the history of this building it took that internal skeleton and made it external by cutting off the, uh, the volume of the building that surrounded it. So not in a literal sense, um, but in a very real and very readable sense, that internal skeleton of the building in metal is becoming an external part of the building. So if appropriateness simply means that the new looks like the old, I would be the first one to say this is not appropriate. Um, but that, in our fundamental view, is not what appropriateness says. The new doesn't have to literally equal the old, but it has to explore it. Um, this would not be nearly as interesting uh, or appropriate a solution if this simply were the glass box or the sheer glass curtain wall or the imitation uh, of, of a new building. Um, but in this vocabulary of modern materials, there is a whole woven texture of, of echoes and allusions to the materials and the history of this building. And that, at least to me, is one of the most exciting manifestations of a program. Th uh, thank you. Are there other questions for uh, the applicant? Yes, you'd like to say something? Yeah, I'd like to add one more comment. Yes. Because there was a comment about maybe perhaps keeping the existing facade. And I just want to point out, I don't know if we did that, the existing facade um, behind the plaster has a combination of brick, CMU, sheetrock, infill. I mean, it's not consistent. If we had to clean this, the plaster out, we would find many patches of different materials in there that we couldn't just preserve or maintain. I just want to make sure this. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions for the applicant? or? Some questions. Okay. We want, um, any other questions? All right. We can go into comment. Yes, Adi. Um, let's see. I, I think in this case, I, I very strongly agree with both positions, and I think both um, sides of this philosophical argument have made their cases uh, very powerfully. Both, the, you know, the, the testimony about what it means to actually um, encounter the facade of the historic district from across from the river and, and from Manhattan and to know that it's sort of intact. Um, this proposal undoes that, but it undoes it well. It, it does a good job, I think, of, of, um, of referring to this kind of break or tear or, uh, in Hebrew, it's a better word, but um, it, it, it evokes what you're trying to get at, I think. But, um, and so it's, the, the approach is, is very clear. I, I do, and I'm, and I'm also interested in the fact that there has been and there is change to the site in, in replacing what was once um, industrial, heavy duty commercial with um, public green space. That too is a transformation to the historic character and I think is important for us to keep in mind. It's, you know, it's a change, and it's a change in terms of use, but also in terms of kind of what we see there, and we, and we accept that, we welcome that. So I think that's, that's important to keep in mind. There is an image, um, if on page 11, anyway, it, it's an image that's, I, I think, very interesting in the book, in the paper, I don't know if it'll read the same uh, in the slide. Um, it's the image on the bottom right, and I mean, I, I don't really know what to do about it, but it, it's not, 
It is not, it's neither the existing building, uh, nor is it exactly your kind of shimmering um, glass reflective uh, crystalline image. It's much more of a kind of a muted, mm, opaque uh, statement. <laughs> and I'm not sure what that is. And I'm, I'm just wondering if there has any thought been given to toning down the reflectivity the kind of and the and the transparent quality of the of your proposal, and having having it sort of have something more to do with it with this, which almost looks like it could be sort of a draw cloth or you know something something that is more opaque. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to get closer to the historic, or if it's going to get closer to the brick on the other side. But there is something that's just a, a bit more. Um, I don't know, muted in this that, that is interesting to me. So I'll just leave it at that for now. Yes. Fred. Okay. Um, I, for one, really appreciated the um, uh, Bill Higgins wrap up um, stating um, that with such clarity the centuries old, I'm not sure it's centuries old, but maybe it is that old um, um, issue that, that this um, application represents, I think, as clearly as any that I've seen in, in my time as a commissioner. Um, and um, conceptually, I, f I fall on the side of um, creating new when the conditions are right within a historic district or, a histor or a, an individual landmark um, to, to create that new in a way that is um, sympathetic uh, to the original but is um, a part of our contemporary world. And for me, this does it very well. And I was um, moved by the testimony, uh, listened to it carefully, uh, but my own thoughts and belief, uh, um, beliefs are that um, this, is, this is how you do, um, uh, th this is how you come to a, a situation where the building this is an unusual condition where the building has been broken apart. Uh, it faces uh, away from, entirely away from, the historic district. Three sides of it uh, continue, um, uh, uh, will continue to be, in fact, will, will become much enhanced in its um, restoration aspects um, to make it a more compatible building within the hist historic district. But that part that faces uh, the openness, the water, the park, um, to me has poetically, lyrically been um, uh, composed in a way that um, faces the future of our city too. So I think this is a very exciting and not replicatable. This is not, you know, as I like to say often, I don't think anything is really a precedent here. Everything has to see, be seen as its own um, a series of conditions. So I wouldn't argue with any of it. I think it's a, it's a lyrical, personal statement of, of great beauty, and um, um, I, 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 I could vote for it right now. Uh, I, I would just, uh, I would agree with Fred on, uh, um, on almost everything he said. Uh, first of all, I think that the conclusion and the wrap-up was very, very helpful, and I found the entire presentation very compelling and persuasive in making the argument towards appropriateness. Uh, I think the commission historically has, as noted, found appropriateness in modern interpretations, as well as buildings that are much more contextual. Uh, so that the idea that this building breaks away from using the same vocabulary and material that is, predominates the district doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's not appropriate because it's chosen different materials. Um, I think that the site's uh, particular history and location and context really does allow, in my opinion, an expression as bold as this. Uh, I think that just going back to the history, which I found particularly compelling of it being broken off, and in the last summation, that the structure comes out was very compelling because I think that rationalizes in a very meaningful way the treatment of the facade. 
Um, and a different building may just not be able to do that because it does not have that unique structure that we've seen uh, from the photographs. So, uh, so that was one thing. I think it's history of being a sugar factory and um, also adds to it and that it's juxtapos juxtaposition uh, with the Manhattan Bridge, which is very structural, uh, gives it additional meaning. Uh, I think that they have worked within elements that recall what the building was intended in terms of proportions, uh, which I, again uh, makes this particular expression um, much more appropriate. So I, I would also support the project as it is. I'd like to start by asking a um, question about um, the standard that we're looking at here. Because uh, I want to understand from, um, it seems that we're working from the notion that um, there's a different standard for the facade of a building that's not seen from the, within the district, as opposed to a facade that's seen from um, outside of it, as we are here. Um, so for example, if this building was in, on the edge of the Tribeca Historic District, um, do we have a different standard because I'm standing on the outside the district than if I was standing inside? No, no, there's no different standard outside the district. So, um, right, the commission regulates entire facades of all buildings, and, and we do not have a different standard for the facades that face outside of the district versus the facades that face within the district. So, um, and in fact, often find designs to be the, the sort of marking of the new district if you're looking into the district from that position. So um, we regulate it the same way. There's no different standard. And so the question is, given the site conditions, the history of this site and the expression of this design and its references to the historic um, features and evolution of the building, is that appropriate regardless of which side of the building you're on? Um, it just happens that three of the facades are intact, so there's one approach being taken toward those, and this facade is non-original, so it's a different approach being taken, but you would still find it appropriate within the context of the district. I, I think I'm gonna end up um, being characterized as the dinosaur um, in this one. Um, I like what it looks like. I think it's a wonderful facade, but I'm not sure that's um, the standard um, for this commission. Um, if you were to ask the question whether this preserves the special historical architectural quality of the building in the district, um, that's a different question than whether I like it. Um, I think from outside the district, um, there are a wide range of options in between, um, and I know you can't, I accept, you cannot restore what wasn't there. But there's a wide range of options between there and where we are in this proposal. Um, and what this building does for me, if I'm standing um, on the Manhattan side, um, is it doesn't tell me this is what the Dumbo Historic District is all about. Um, it says to me, um, look at me. Um, I'm not like all the others. Uh, and so I think I will be characterized as the dinosaur. All right, other comments? Yes. I will join you in the Libre tar pit, sir. My visceral response, first I would, I would say thank you for the approach to the three original facades um, and my visceral response to that northern facade was well here's another faceted glass trendy facade on a building in New York City but to go beyond that here's here's a building in an historic district and while we would celebrate that that cutting off of the building when I hear that there is stucco, there is brick, there is steel, um, that gets me a little excited. And I think, well, there's a wonderful palette of materials to deal with. Um, I think I would agree with uh, 
with Bill that we should never be slaves to context, but the characterization of this as, as being even moderately muscular, I think is, is off the target. It, it, the light behind the steel, the new steel, the new metal, um, actually exacerbates the problem for me. It seems extremely diaphanous in a neighborhood that, that I think needs to be muscular. These were industrial buildings, these were hardworking buildings, and it is simply, it's simply that, you know, we started off with a, with a facade that probably had 25 or 30 percent void against the mass. Once that cutting occurred, we had about a 50-50, and now we're down to a 10% mass with 90% void. I would, like, I would just ask the applicant to, to muscle up, beef up that facade a little bit. I'm, I would not say that this is outright a, a wrong approach, but I think the, the fact that what we're left with here is this diaphanous curtain in this neighborhood is not the way to approach it. All right, uh, other comments? I know Michael has not had a chance to look at this, uh, but other comments for now? Yes. Um, okay, so I, uh, I guess as an architect, appreciate what the architect has designed. Um, and so I, um, and I, as others have said, um, have gone back before, uh, between the, the two arguments of, of why it should be appropriate and not appropriate. Um, so in terms of the architectural, when I look at it as something that um, is a replacement for a wall that wasn't original, I mean, yes, it has um, structure and it has materials that are solid, and, um, but because they weren't original, I could almost say that this is um, something that's appropriate for it. But, but when I look at it in terms of uh, what you see from the water, even though that's, you're looking from outside the district, I still want it to be a building that has a facade that was approved because it was found appropriate for a building in the district. And I think that this is a facade which would be appropriate for a building that's um, not in the district, more than one that is. And, um, and so I guess for that reason, I also think that maybe this is not the right facade in terms of appropriateness for a building district. Although, I don't say that it, it couldn't be glassy and it couldn't be whatever. And I think that um, they did start in terms of relating to why, um, how the building, um, the new glass facade related to the um, masonry facade. I think that that was a good line to go down and I guess I would want to see that um, more, that expressed in more detail than it is. It's like the whole idea of the, of the bottom, the middle, and the, and the attic part, I think, doesn't quite make it, but I think that that's a good theory, and if it did, it, it would. So, so I like it, but I think not. All right, uh, other yeah. comments? Yes. I think excellent uh, presentation. I think three of the facades are quite perfect, quite historic. The north facade, I think, is striking, but it's just hard to call it. Historic, I think if there were some elements from the other three facades in the north facade, maybe just a little bit, but uh, otherwise I think it's, it's, I like the direction. Okay. Um, Michael, you wouldn't want to comment. Okay. All right. So we've heard the comments. It seems that the commission would like uh, the applicants to go back and at least rethink the north facade. Uh, I would just say one thing that um, what I found very compelling in the presentation is that the design of this facade is almost like so pure and well thought out that sometimes this intervention of putting in more masonry or making it heavier can take away something which is really very nice. And, um, and so I always have a little bit of concern of trying to inject design ideas, particularly from many sides, but I think, uh, I think there's an overall sort of concern from the commission that this needs to sort of incorporate some more of the historic fabric or recall it or tell that story a little bit better. Um, I just would say that the commission has 
and maybe all the commissioners don't agree to it, we've looked at different buildings and allowed different buildings that are um, very, very stark in its contrast to the predominant, pre predominating character of the district, where it's also been significantly visible, like in front of a park, you can see the skyline uh, from somewhere else. Um, but uh, this is, it is a very, very prominent site, if not one of the most prominent sites I've seen in terms of uh, its ability to be seen from many angles. And so uh, there, even if we were to approve something like this in some other manner, I think it is such a significant site that it's worth really going back and thinking about that as well. Um, the, the arguments or the philosophy or the reflection of uh, how this is appropriate in terms of being within Dumbo, in terms of its history, uh, are abstract. So I think when people see it from outside, they say glass building. They don't immediately make the connection to the fact that this was a sugar factory or it's, this was a building that was broken. But I think over time, these stories lend themselves to, uh, to in fact, the history of Dumbo, which it is changing. And I, I think I found your comment very interesting, which is the stark um, industrial nature of the district is already changing because of these softening elements, even though the waterfront is really uh, not a part of the district, but it has changed in terms of its interface. It is soft and uh, differently used from um, a historic waterfront. All right, any other comments? Okay, so in that case, we can ask the applicants to come back and we can close the hearing. Thank you, Commissioner.